there, my name's Lee. I'm a real life lawyer on a mission to demystify the law and how it affects your everyday life. Today, I'm gonna react to Bailey Sarian talking about the Lisa Montgomery case. There was a whole spate of federal executions that happened at the end of the Trump presidency that were really problematic. And I think that Lisa Montgomery's story is much like the Eileen Warno story, which I went into in a past video, is a, an example of a microcosm of our justice system and how completely incapable it is of taking childhood trauma, gender-based trauma into account when sentencing people. And sometimes that means that our government is killing people on our behalf without fully acknowledging usually decades of trauma underlying the crimes being committed. Much like the Eileen Warnos case, the question here is not whether or not Lisa Montgomery did the heinous crime that she did. She did it. We all know she did it. She confessed to it. The problem, however, is in the insufficient representation, allegedly, that she had at the trial phase, which didn't give her the opportunity to fully express the level of trauma that she had experienced in the past and how that informed her mental illness, her actions, and what how it ultimately led to her committing this crime. It's a difficult line to walk though, however, because of course people who experience childhood trauma don't always turn into murderers. It's a disservice to people who have experienced childhood trauma and abuse to say that she only committed this heinous act because of her mental illness based on her abuse. Like, where's the line there? I don't know, but I don't think that our justice system is has figured it out either. So Lisa's story kind of gets at that. So I wanted to see Bailey's take on it and maybe fill in some some blanks when it comes to the legal aspect of this case. Let's watch. Before I get started, let me say I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. Nothing that I say should be construed as legal advice and you should always seek the advice of a licensed attorney before making any legal decisions. I am also not a criminal law expert. I'm just someone who practices law, went to law school and likes to think about these things. All right, so let's learn together. Okay. Hi friends, how are you today? Hi Bailey. I gotta say, I respect the hustle and the like lo-fi video editing. Like she is not paying epidemic sound a penny and yet her videos are exceptionally entertaining. So good for her. Also, as with um, some of my last videos, uh, if you hear any snorting or snoring in the background, it's my new puppy. Stick around to the end if you'd like to meet her. The scene they found that day was so bloody. He and his four co colleagues are still traumatized by it to this day. Can I ask something that I always forget to Google, but I've always been curious for anyone out there who's like a detective or something and sees these really awful crime scenes. Do they offer you guys like therapy and stuff or do they or do they not? I really hope they do. Okay, so um, obviously I'm not a detective. I'm a lawyer and I have not worked at the state level on crimes like this, but when I worked briefly for the federal government. I uh, worked on a child assault case. Obviously, when you're trying to prosecute someone for inappropriate pictures of children, you have to collect and view those pictures. And um, there is a special group of people that do that. They're trained and then and everyone else is screened from that evidence. So I don't know who has the job of figuring out which evidence is the inappropriate stuff, but they screen it out. And then only the people who are specially trained in that are actually going to go through that. I imagine there's at least a level of training that goes into uh, dealing with crime scenes and seeing it. And I imagine also after you see it enough, you kind of become desensitized to it. Like if you're a doctor and you're cutting into people's bodies, like I think at some point, but obviously not because these people were clearly really, really traumatized and, and how much can you actually cut your emotions off from something that horrific. At least at the federal level, I can say for certain situations, there is people with special training that handle that. Okay, look, the whole like thing when I do these videos, I like to figure out like where these killers and bad people come from because I think it actually makes more sense as to why they did what they did. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of people confuse that with me like trying to make you feel bad for these people. And like you can't, you're allowed to feel bad for these people, but I think it makes you understand why they do the things they do. And I think that's a really important point because I think in our criminal justice system, especially with the death penalty, we have this really black and white view of good people versus bad people. And if you are a bad person, you'll get caught and you deserve the justice that is served upon you. And if you're a good person, then you won't have any run-ins with the law because you're following the law. The reality is that humans are very complicated. Nothing is black and white like that. Our criminal justice system doesn't take that into consideration and doesn't really do a great job of looking at a person's whole history and whole life and then 
being empathetic about um, how they ended up where they are. Because like she said, someone doesn't just go murder someone and then cut the baby out of their stomach for fun to be a bad person, generally. I will say, I think I have a little less empathy for like the Ted Bundys of the world or like the white male mass shooters. I, I've yet to hear a sob story out of them that makes me think, oh, okay, I, I, I don't think what he did was right, but I can understand how he got to where he is. I've not yet gotten there. Like Ted Bundy, there's no reason why he did that shit other than his own like misogynist superiority power mongering complex. But for these cases, like Eileen Warnos, it's just a matter of awful things happen to these people and you can feel empathy for them while also wanting justice for the person who was murdered because obviously that person was murdered, that's awful. And people want some sort of closure on that when the reality is that sometimes people do bad things because bad things have happened to them. Punishing them by death is not solving the underlying issue and it's not gonna bring the person who died back. Like sometimes it's just awful and sad and like no amount of justice is ever going to really rectify that. That's what I felt when I've been to other sentencing hearings where someone has been put behind bars for like 18 years for doing heinous things. And I was expecting to go to that hearing and look at that person and think that they're a monster and watch them get sentenced and put behind bars and think that there's some vindication in that. But I've always left feeling really f depressed because like that person is now going to be behind bars for 18 years. Are they gonna have the resources they need to get the help that they need to realize what they did was wrong or turn their life around or I don't know, learn anything out of it? Probably not. Is the family gonna get their person who was murdered back or will the person whose life was ruined because of these crimes get the time back, get the trauma removed because this person is put behind bars? No, that's not how it works. So. I feel like our justice system offers this kind of false promise of vindication when someone is uh, punished because of the crimes that they did, but really what it comes down to is just like really depressing reality that like hurt people hurt people and then locking them up forever is not really the solution either. So I don't think that you should feel like Bailey Sarian is trying to make you feel bad for the murderers here. I think that you should appreciate the fact that she is humanizing people who do bad things because as much as there's the argument that like criminals don't deserve the limelight, I think there is also an equal argument for sometimes people who become criminals become that way because of circumstances that were beyond their control and as a very understandable human reaction to some awful things that they went through in their past. So it's not black and white. There's no way to rectify it. It's just the reality of our justice system. And it's really f***ed up, so. Diane later on in life would describe Judy as manipulative and just plain evil, just awful person. She would go on to say that she enjoyed torturing the people around her and she got a joy out of it. I just don't understand how you could do that. Intergenerational trauma. Would be like, come on over. I have a child that you can take advantage of and do whatever you want with. Like how sick are you? I will say, I think my empathy stops with child predators. I don't think that they should be put to death. That's for sure. But I also don't know that there is rehabilitation possible when it comes to people like that. So it's hard. It's not black and white. I, I've a, I really struggle with that one. During her marriage to Kevin, she claimed to be pregnant three different times. The last time being in 2004 with a due date of January 16th. That is my birthday. I don't like that, mm, mm So it's believed that's why she went, killed Bobby Joe, took Victoria Joe, the baby out of, they keep calling it kidnapping, but is that kidnapping? Cause in my mind, cutting a baby out of someone's stomach is not kidnapping. It is kidnapping. Let's talk about it. So Lisa Montgomery was formally charged with the federal crime of kidnapping resulting in death. She was charged under the Federal Kidnapping Act, which was passed in 1932 as a result of the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. I don't know if you know about that story, but like Charles Lindbergh, famous, you know, airplane guy, really wealthy, well-known, his baby's stolen and murdered. And it was a huge story, I think internationally. And so obviously then, you know, things like that happen and new laws are passed typically. So uh, the Federal Kidnapping Act was passed. This is a federal law as opposed to a state law. This is an important fact because usually with these types of murder cases, we're in state court, Ted Bundy, video up here, state court, Eileen Warno, state court, because usually murder is a state crime. The feds don't often get involved when it's a murder case. However, with kidnapping in this situation and in the Lindbergh situation, if the kidnapping 
kidnapper crosses state lines in the course of the kidnapping, then it becomes a federal issue. The reason why this uh, federal kidnapping act was passed was because state authorities, state cops can't really effectively prosecute crimes when they cross state lines because it's outside of their jurisdiction. Whereas the FBI can get involved and they can have national jurisdiction to handle cases like this. So in this situation, because she crossed state lines from Missouri to Kansas, when she took that baby, it's kidnapping and the kidnapping resulted in death. The Federal Kidnapping Act says, whoever unlawfully seizes, confines, inveigles, decoys, kidnaps, abducts, or carries away and holds for ransom or reward or otherwise any person, when the offender travels in interstate or foreign commerce or uses the mail or any means, facility, or instrumentality of interstate or foreign commerce in committing or in furtherance of the commission of the offense, shall be punished by imprisonment for any term of years or for life. And if the death of any person results from this kidnapping, they shall be punished by death or life imprisonment. So basically, because death occurred in the process of this kidnapping, she automatically gets either life in prison or the death penalty. There was a question that came up in the trial that the death occurred prior to the kidnapping, meaning that the victim was dead and then she cut the baby out. So she didn't kidnap the baby until after someone was dead. So was there even a death in the commission of this kidnapping, which like did not get very far in court. But it's interesting because Bailey said that there was blood in between her toes indicating that she got up after she was cut open, meaning that she wasn't dead before the kidnapping occurred or at least commenced. So I don't know where that played in the, in the trial. I didn't find anything on that, but it's an interesting little tidbit. But yes, she was tried and convicted of kidnapping under a federal kidnapping law. Because death resulted in the commission of this kidnapping, she could be sentenced to life in prison or the death penalty. So technically, yeah, it was kidnapping. Some would even describe it as the dream team because like they just always won their cases. Like you would want these people on your side. Frederick had tried more than a dozen capital cases. He was also an attorney who had more clients sentenced to death in federal court than any defense lawyer in America. Yeah, so he was the defense attorney who had more clients sentenced to death than anywhere else in America. So she, I don't think that would be a dream team. You'd want your defense attorney to have prevented all of his clients from being sentenced to death. So um, there was at one point an attorney, her last name was Clark, I believe, who was on the case and she ultimately was dismissed and it said that the entire legal team was mainly men and they kind of conspired and got the judge to dismiss her because she was meddling and you know, she was one of those fiery lady lawyers who was just getting in the way of things. She was the part of the dream team that really would have solidified Lisa's team and Lisa's defense because she she was the one who had this background of being this incredible defense attorney and working with some people that were like bad people and getting them free from the death penalty. So like the fact that she was dismissed because the other attorneys were such misogynists that they couldn't handle a woman who knew what she was doing is what partially what sealed the deal for Lisa in this case. Phantom pregnancies where like a woman thinks she's pregnant and then your body reacts and you experience symptoms of pregnancy such as like swelling of the belly. Unfortunately though, like this theory, it didn't stand in court and the prosecution managed to have forensic psychiatrist Park Dates, who worked with prosecutors on the cases of Jeffrey Dahmer and the Unabomber. Anyways, they testified that the diagnosis offered by the defense's main expert witness was voodoo science and excluded from the case entirely on the grounds that it had no scientific basis. So what happened with this expert that they hired to talk about the um, phantom pregnancy diagnosis? Pseudosiasis. Su Pseudosciences. So the defense really railed on this phantom pregnancy idea that she thought she was pregnant and that somehow proved that she was insane and didn't understand the nature of her actions. Basically an insanity defense is saying, yes, okay, she did it. However, she was insane. She didn't know what she was doing. She didn't know how to conform her actions to what the law requires. And so she should not be punished for what happened. The issue with, with this expert and with this whole defense is that like, there was so many other things wrong with her that relying exclusively on this phantom pregnancy issue made their case weaker because they could have relied on the years and years of trauma on you know scans of her brain that actually showed that it did not function properly and that there were 
aspects of her brain that clearly showed that she was not functioning at a level where she could understand her actions. And this doctor that they hired did not have a background in the phantom pregnancy diagnosis that they were trying to prove. And the scans that he did provide of her brain didn't really conclusively show like that her actions were caused because of her the brain differences. So the court threw it out because they were like, there is no probative value to this expert and his expertise is questionable at best. So like, again, this was a shortcoming on the defense's side where they picked an expert who didn't have an expertise in what they the defense they were trying to claim and the defense they were trying to claim was really insufficient given her entire horrific history and all of the abuse and the potential other issues that she had that could have supported their insanity defense. That being said, however, claiming insanity to defend yourself against a murder charge is a very high bar. It is rare to meet that bar such that you don't get charged at all. So there are two different parts of a death sentence trial that are important to understand. First, you have the trial itself to determine guilt, but then you have the sentencing, which determines whether or not they will be given life imprisonment or the death sentence. So trial phase, you're determining guilt. Did she do it or didn't she do it? That's where they were trying to, to claim that she was insane. And so even though she did do it, she shouldn't be punished. Then you get to the sentencing section, which is, okay, she did it, we found her guilty. Now, should she be sentenced to life in prison or does she deserve the death penalty? And then there's kind of a mini trial that happens where you bring what's known as a mitigating witness up and they have done a bunch of analysis of the defendant to see kind of what is going on in their brains. If there is some sort of insanity or some psychosis or something going on there that explains the actions that'll mitigate against a death sentence. So by using a mitigation expert, so that they can say like, okay, here's the years of abuse she experienced. Here's a bunch of brain scans we have. Here are our diagnoses of her. And here is why she doesn't deserve the death sentence because she did not understand what she was doing. That would at least lower lower her sentence from the death penalty to a life sentence. So of course they're trying to appeal the case. They don't want her to die to get a death penalty. And then during the appeals process, Experts examined Lisa and found that unbeknownst to her trial jury, her upbringing had left her suffering from florid psychosis, bipolar disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Right, and so the jury in her original trial should have been told that because her defense attorneys should have hired the correct experts to have done these types of background analyses, to have presented this information to the jury to begin with. So Frederick responded to the appeal with an affidavit of over a hundred pages defending his legal proceedings, insisting that none of the issues raised by her appeal lawyers have merit and that this this former client's appeal lawyers were nothing more than spoiled, selfish prima donnas. That's what he said. Because they were women, they were meddling. Just recently, like a couple months ago, January 1st, 2021, the judge granted a stay of her execution on the ground that her mental competence must first be tested as executing individuals with intellectual disabilities violates the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution regarding cruel and unusual punishment. That's accurate. That was decided in a case called Atkins versus Virginia in 2002 by the US Supreme Court. I believe we talked about that in my Eileen Warnos video. In December of 2020, Lisa was sentenced to be put to death January 12th. However, the defense attorneys moved to have that stayed because they needed more time to request clemency for her because they had contracted COVID-19. Despite this fact, despite that they had requested an extension on clemency, the correctional facility scheduled her death to take place on January 12th. So a judge ruled, hey, you can't do that. We're still waiting on her clemency petition. Her attorneys are sick with COVID. Like you can't just then schedule it. So they did stay her execution pending that clemency request. Then an appeals court, because this was appealed by the prosecutors, because those prosecutors wanted her dead. The appeals court said that that was improper, which basically reinstated that January 12th execution date. But then yes, under this Atkins v. Virginia, because it's against the 
Eighth Amendment to put to death a person who has an intellectual disability. Someone who claims that has the right to a examination to determine whether or not they are fit to be put to death, which we want to make them make sure they're mentally fit to be murdered. Do we feel all right about that? Um, so she got that examination and then um, it was ruled that she was fit to be murdered and then the her defense attorneys appealed one last time up to the Supreme Court on January 12th, the day that she was meant to be put to death. The Supreme Court upheld her death sentence and um, she was put to death in the wee hours of the morning of January 13th. Interestingly, again, this was at the end of the Trump presidency and he was expediting federal executions. There hadn't been a federal execution in like 17 years and he was the first lame duck president to order a rapid fire federal execution since like the 1800s. Like it was, you know, barbaric. He just wanted people to die. I'll note as well that while he was expediting federal executions, he was also expediting pardons for all of his friends and cronies uh, before leaving office as well. So <laughs> funny how that works. You know, I just, it's hard to have compassion for her when she did something really, 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 really awful. I don't know how I feel. How do you feel? I would love to hear your guys' thoughts down below. Do you think Lisa should have been executed? I'll answer, I say no. I don't believe in the federal death penalty. I don't think that we should give the government the power to be killing people and determining whether or not someone deserves to live or die because they get it wrong a lot. If you are curious and want to kind of delve into your confusion, Bailey or anyone else, I highly suggest reading Just Mercy by Bryan Stevenson. It is a great, great, book. It's nonfiction. He works on wrongful convictions and he has gotten a lot of people exonerated. And the book, Just Mercy, there's a movie too, but like the book's better. Sorry. Watch both because Michael B. Jordan's in it and like I could sit and watch him for 90 minutes any day. But the book itself is much better um, and it goes way more in depth in all these people's stories. But Brian Stevenson does a really good job of laying out like people can do awful things and still deserve mercy or some sort of empathy or something more than what we're doing by murdering them and keeping them in federal prisons, you know? Again, like I said, it's not black and white. And I think Just Mercy does a really good job of laying that out. So if you're curious about um, our criminal justice system, the death penalty, how it gets it wrong, delving more into mental health in our justice system and learning about how how to wrap your head around a system that isn't that just, Just Mercy is a good one. Look, in this country, we care more about getting rid of people than we do helping people when they go through traumatic shit. So it makes sense in this country. That's another great point too. If you look at Lisa's story, she did something awful, yes, but our system failed her over and over and over again. There's an article I read, I'll link it in the comments below, that kind of lays out how the system failed her, but like child services should have stepped in when she was a child. Mental health services should have stepped in when she was a child. People in authority knew that she was being abused. I mean, many people since her conviction in her appeals process testified in support of her not getting the death sentence because so many people knew that this was happening and did nothing. People in authority, judges, social workers, teachers, people knew it was happening and no one did anything. Our system failed her over and over and over again. And then the ultimate failure was putting her to death for doing something heinous. That was the outcome of many, many years of our system failing her over and over and over again. And our system does this every day to people every day. Do those people murder people in heinous ways? No, of course not. But it's worth thinking about how having a system that actually functions to give people the support they need when they're children, when they're adolescents, when they're going through hard times as adults is a much more effective way of preventing crime, not all of it, but some of it, than the threat of future death penalty potentially happening if you commit a horrible crime. You know, the threat of punishment does not do what early intervention could have done for Lisa and could do for a lot of people. Because I strongly believe that if you have a stable life, access to shelter, access to food, access to safety, feeling safe where you live, if you have all that, your likelihood of committing a crime is probably gonna go down. Like, realistically, it would have been nice if she could receive some kind of help, but was it gonna happen? Fucking no, because that's not how this place works, you know? Oh my God, get me out of here. The number of people that comment on my videos that are like, wow, America sounds awful. <laughs> help. Where is 
Bobby Joe's family now. I don't know. I didn't look it up. I didn't want to because, you know, they've been through a lot. Just leave them alone. I did Google to try to see if I could find out what happened to the baby because fascinating. And it looks like her family has done a really good job of keeping her away from the media and out of the limelight because a brief Google search at least did not turn up really any information, though she would be 17 years old now. So fascinating. All right. So that's the story of Lisa Montgomery as told by Bailey Sarian and then reacted to by me, a lawyer. I hope you found that entertaining. If you did, um, comment below if there's other things you'd like me to react to. Give this video a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day, a goodbye. Oh, you wanna meet my puppy? <gasps> Say hi. Hi, sweet girl. Is this your time to shine? Do you love it? Do you love the limelight? My sweet snorty girl. This is Moira. She's an English bulldog. She's the snortiest thing I've ever met in my entire life because her face is flat. So if you hear snorting in the background, it's this little thing. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Goodbye. All right. <laughs> okay, bye.